What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. Today, we have another dark one for you, and this one actually comes out of Singapore. Let's go ahead and dive into the Toa Pio murders. Adrian Lim. I think that he was evil. Toa Pio. This district is where Adrian bought a three-room flat, a seventh floor unit, number 467F on block 12. He was practicing like magic. Kali. In some sects, she's known as the mother of the universe. The most powerful way to please the goddess is the blood of another human. With his egg ritual, he would convince many of his clients that he could access supernatural abilities. Adrian said that if she ever betrayed him, she would die a horrible death. To this very day, these murders are remembered as the worst in Singaporean history. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I am your host, Josh. In the studio, I'm joined by the boys, co-host Austin. Hey, what's up, guys? And producer Daniel. Hey, guys. Today, we have another dark one for you, and this one actually comes out of Singapore. We're going to start traversing the world a little bit. We've covered quite a few psychopaths here in the United States, and there is no end to the number of psychopaths we could cover here, but it's nice to branch out a little bit and start diving into some of the other just atrocities that have occurred around the world. And today's case is on the Toa Pio murders. This was done by an individual by the name Adrian Lim. And Adrian is one of those individuals who claim to have supernatural powers, let's say he's a medium, and really used it to manipulate his victims into doing things to feed his own personal sick desires, ultimately. But before we get into that, just quickly wanted to mention a couple of things here. We are in the works of launching the official Lights Out Low Lives. And this will be our YouTube membership, I guess, fan club through the YouTube platform but I wanted to mention that we are working on that and we're very close to officially unveiling that as well as a date for when that will go live, which is very exciting. It's another way for you to support the channel and allow you to take part in some really cool perks and benefits from that. So more on that next week as we're still kind of ironing out the last few details, but very exciting because you can become a Lights Out Low Life. Very fun stuff. Also, make sure you go and take advantage of the last Two designs we have from the Cryptic Collection. I think we are literally almost sold out. I think we have a few more sizes left of the Jersey Devil. And God, I always forget what the other one is. I think the Black Shuck. Thank you, the Black Shuck. Yes, which was honestly my favorite design. So go cop that if you don't have it already, because once those are gone, they're never coming back because every collection from here on out through merch store will be a limited collection. So once we're out, we're moving on. But it's just another way to support the show. And if you're not able to support the show through merch or through our future fan club, a free way to do it that only takes two seconds is to make sure you're subscribed on whatever platform you're enjoying the show from, whether that's YouTube, Spotify, I think it's following on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. We really do appreciate it. It does help us out immensely along with the ratings and reviews, good or bad, you know, we'll take it. Yeah, I'm ready. You know, we shed a few tears sometimes, but we get over it. Okay. I kind of like getting grilled. Uh, yeah, you know. I mean, Austin gets grilled more than <laughs> Daniel and I, so, you know, keep keep the criticism coming. Yeah, I was born for this. You got to really get it together, man. <laughs> I'm a mess. <laughs> <laughs> Always a mess. But let's put our straight faces on, because this is an especially brutal case. It also involves children, which is always deeply disturbing. But let's go ahead and dive into the Toa Pio murders. So we have to begin our story today by talking about Adrian Lim. Adrian Lim was born on January 6, 1942. The Japanese bombing and invasion of Singapore was right around the corner. One newspaper called the island a blazing hell during the attacks. Many locals struggled to evacuate the island and families would be lucky if they could board a ship and escape to Europe. 
so many of them had to endure the invasion. The British who controlled the island failed to defend it. Adrian was the eldest son in his family and he was raised in a middle class home. By the end of World War II, his father worked as a civil servant and early on his parents could already sense a growing anger inside their eldest son. Even his younger sister always saw him as a hot-tempered boy. He attended an Anglo-Chinese primary school, but he didn't do well academically. As he got older, he dropped out of secondary school and found a job as an informant for the Internal Security Department. The Internal Security Department, or ISD, was a domestic counterintelligence and security agency. They monitored things like terrorism, racial tension, and the rise in communism. So Adrian's role was to rat out anyone he suspected of being involved with a movement against the state. After a short time at ISD, he became an electrician and found a job working for a cable radio company. This company was Rediffusion Singapore, and he got this job when he was 19. This was Singapore's first cable transmitted radio station. For three years, he installed and serviced Rediffusion sets, and later he was promoted to bill collector. By 1967, he fell in love with his childhood sweetheart, but she was Catholic and he wasn't, so he ended up converting to Catholicism so he could marry her. Before we dive too deep into the story, I think it's important to note maybe just a small history of faith in Singapore because it does have kind of an interesting clash. Early in the 1800s, many immigrants poured into the Malaysian Peninsula and they colonized settlements, including Singapore. At the time, it was kind of small today. It's a pretty big city, but these new migrant belief systems came in and they kind of clashed with people who had been there for potentially generations, right? But instead of normally you'd see like one powerful religion just coming in and wiping out the other, but in this case, it was more like a clash of beliefs and they fused instead. So you see a little bit of Catholicism and you also see a little bit of the remnants of kind of like a almost indigenous faith more invested in jungle spirits and things like that because before it was a massive city it was just a lot of trees so um and these spirits basically came from the trees or at least that's what these shamans believed their faith leaders at the time believed that they could communicate with these spirits that were out in the jungle and these were called bomos or dukkas they were shamans, and some were also healers, herbalists, geomancers, and or sorcerers. So a lot of these mediums performed rituals where they invited the spirits of the jungle to possess their own bodies, and then they would chant and dance and sing things and say things. They would basically, the spirits could use them as a vessel, and they would sometimes they would offer up blessings or advice or Sometimes if the wrong spirit invaded, it could start cursing people or placing hexes on people. At least that was the belief, right? Many of these mediums also ended up running really successful businesses. But what happened is that in the years after Singapore gained its independence from Britain in 1965, and I think it became its own city state a few years later, it rapidly grew. A lot of tourism, a booming economy, so all these dense urban city centers started to crop up where there used to be jungles, which is where a lot of people gleaned their spiritual energy from. So that was kind of a problem. But you saw at the time in the 60s, you kind of saw a shift where by the 70s, a lot of these mediums were moving into these dense districts. Right. And that's kind of where to set the scene of what Adrian is going to be a part of. Right. Like the... The changes of the landscape were so dramatic going from, like you said, dense jungles to now huge multi-story apartment buildings and things like that where it's super congested. I mean, if you look at Singapore today, it's it's a massive, huge, massive urban society that's just blanketed with high-rise buildings and stuff, and which is very similar to a lot of other Asian countries who saw a major boom in, in their industries and things like that were... You know, they kind of, rather than building outward, they build upward. Mm -hmm. And so it's just people everywhere. It's interesting that there is this fusion, though, of, of spiritual practices and that it wasn't completely eradicated, in, like in many cases when stuff like this happened. So, but Catholicism coming in, that's it's very yeah. interesting that Catholicism was coexisting with some of these others. Not that it can't coexist, but it's just in a lot of cases, especially 
prior in history, you know, you'd see that. And if you practice anything other than that, you were. Yeah. The Spanish inquisitors were coming in and yeah. Wiping out your entire culture. Yeah. But, and so that's why we see Adrian, uh, shift. He's like, Oh, I'll convert to Catholicism, but we'll see it. It's just to get married. And right. It's, that's why he still got these other yeah. spiritual beliefs mm -hmm. of his. So locals had to move into districts with public housing and high rise apartments. Like I was just saying, and Toapayo was one of these districts. Its name translates to Big Swamp. This district is where Adrian bought a three-room flat, a seventh floor unit, number 467F on block 12, and he lived there with his wife, and they later had two children together. The area had become known for its crime in the 1960s. The media even coined it the Chicago of Singapore. But over the next decade, crime rates in the district would drop. And while he lived here, Adrian became fascinated with the amount of local spiritual mediums that had flocked to the public housing. He saw how successful their businesses were. And even though he was a practicing Catholic and had a full-time job, Adrian began working as a spirit medium in 1973. So you're probably like, well, how do you just like be a practicing Catholic then all of a sudden be a you know, medium? I mean, it's, it's kind of a big jump there. Right. So according to Adrian, he learned how to be a medium through Bomo, nicknamed Uncle Willie. Uncle Willie was famous for his work around town. He sold potions, placed hexes, and removed hexes depending on who was paying him. Uncle Willie promised to teach Adrian his ways, but only for a nice chunk of money every so often. During the lessons, Willie once gathered a small crowd and sliced his arm with a ceremonial sword. He then had his assistant capture his blood in a bowl. Then he took a thin golden trident about three feet long, pierced his tongue, and then held the trident between his teeth. Willie then danced around the room, splashing blood across the floor. Then he took the bowl and drank the rest. He finished the ceremony by spitting blood across the statues and religious pictures that sat on his altar as the crowd cheered. After the ceremony, he told Adrian that mutilation and piercings were a way to drive the demons out. He claimed he never felt any pain from self-mutilation during these ceremonies, and sometimes he would enter trance-like states. Willie told Adrian that if he could pierce his cheeks without blood spilling, the gods approved of him. After weeks of lessons, Adrian then rented a small one-room office inside a brothel and began finding clients for his medium business. Many were recommended by his landlord, Susan. Occasionally, he would get superstitious men and elderly women, but most people who came to his office were young, emotionally distressed women. Many worked as bar girls, dance hostesses, and prostitutes. He started his business by reading tarot cards and recommending potions, but his rituals got more and more sinister as time went on. He quickly realized, oh, I can very easily con these people and make some easy money. When clients came to him, he convinced them that they were plagued by an evil spirit and he would pull out a raw egg. With this egg ritual, he would convince many of his clients that he could access supernatural abilities. So he would hold the egg in his hand and pass it over his client's body several times. He would chant a short incantation and then hand the client the egg. After asking them to crack it open, they would see a small blackened needle inside the yoke. He told them these needles were a sign of evil spirits inhabiting their bodies, but this egg had cleansed them but many didn't realize that Adrian had actually tricked them. Before the session, he would heat up small needles to turn them black and pierce them through the raw eggs. Then he would fill the small hole in the shell with a fine powder, making it look like the eggshell was untouched. This was a trick he learned from Uncle Willie, and Adrian would use this trick on young women. He would claim he had healing powers that could take away their pain. Sometimes he would convince them they needed ECT or electroconvulsive therapy. He would place their feet in a tub of shallow water. Then he would place electrodes in the water and pass electricity through them. As you can imagine, this was uh, not a fun experience, but he promised them that the shocks would cure their headaches and drive away the evil spirits that haunted them. Uncle Willie also taught Adrian how to get any woman to stay loyal to him. All he had to do was get them to drink his urine or swallow his sperm. After all the tips and tricks Willie gave him, he always demanded payment. It wasn't clear when or how much, but Adrian needed to pay. But whenever Willie demanded money, Adrian paid up. And over time, Willie taught Adrian one of his most valuable tricks, picking out the most gullible clients. 
and Adrian became a master manipulator for people desperate for a spiritual change. The fact that he's learning all this from Uncle Willie, like, yeah, right. Who's this guy? Like, he really is trusting that Uncle Willie's teaching him some legitimate tricks. I right. think he knows probably that he's a con man. He's going to teach me how to be a con man, but yes. we're going to do it under this guise that were spiritual mediums. I'm glad you see that pretty quick here. Yeah, it's like it's under the guise of religion, right? As as is a lot of con men, right? The and most uh, vulnerable, sacred part of all of us yeah, being exploited. Exactly. Our and especially, body. you know, emotionally distressed people. That's yeah, what they that seek, too. right? And I know a lot of his rituals were not just, he just didn't make them up. They actually extend back to some indian festival where the the tongue piercing thing yeah i have heard of that before that you can see pictures of the people doing that that, Um, because i have heard that's the self-mutilation thing yeah is a way to drive out evil spirits yeah that goes back a really really long Long time time, i know i know a lot of places though it's been outlawed you can't just slash yourself with a sword in public and spit your blood around they have like a lot of places have put the kibosh on that that'd be uh pretty terrifying to go out to the mall somewhere and some guys like slicing his arm <laughs> open Lord. and drinking it out of a bowl I and then splattering it on the wall. I could not imagine. Oh my God. So disgusted. But yeah, there were, they always tied it back and Adrian's favorite Hindu goddess that he always mentioned, her name was Kali. Um, in some sects, she's known as the mother of the universe. She's well respected for her motherly love and is known to ward off evil spirits and slay demons to establish peace. Uncle Willie mentioned, though, the best way to please this goddess is a blood sacrifice at least once a month. And Adrian took that to heart. And when he asked Uncle Willie, what should I be sacrificing? He said, well, you know, you can use chicken's blood. You could use my your own blood like I just showed you. Or he said the most powerful way to please the goddess is the blood of another human. So Uncle Willie has kind of set the planted these seeds in Adrian's mind over the years though this this is crazy you can do a google search if you want to on this there have been a shocking amount of children sacrificed in the name of Kali um, especially in the eastern world in India you could just google search human sacrifices Kali and google and you'll see quite a disgusting amount on there so this wasn't an I don't think this was like an original idea I think this is stemmed possibly far back um well i mean god human sacrifice goes back all the way to the like the beginning of time pretty much right you can find it you know biblical times and all that so it's not totally surprising but even more recently i mean that's that's pretty wild yeah and it's always specifically like a lot of them specifically are connected to this goddess so do you is is the purpose behind it to you know they offer up this sacrifice and you know there's different tiers of sacrifices they can offer. So if they offer the sacrifice of of another, you know, somebody, an actual human they sacrifice, is there what's the reward? What's the gain for them? Like what's the benefit? It is essentially you're in you're now in Kali's good graces and she will so you're potentially working up manipulate things. Kali's to totem pole there. Like exactly. you're, you're getting how loyal are you to mm. her? And then supposedly she can help you out with things. Mm. That's the idea. So do you think they really believed like Willie and Adrian were really under the belief of the power that Kali has or had. And it's a, it's a great question. We're hoping that's, that that would be bestowed upon them if they did these things. I think that's one of the biggest questions of this case. We'll see if they actually truly believed in what they mm-hmm. were doing or if this was just a way to almost an excuse to be like, oh, we were doing it for this reason as opposed to the million other selfish reasons they could have been doing yeah. these things for. As far as Adrian, we'll we'll get to see his character a little bit more. I'm on the fence about him, but I do. It's hard. I think we should yeah. d- discuss maybe later the where the line between delusion and spiritual belief, where that line is, if there even is one. But we should. That's the biggest question of this case. I think you hit the nail on the head. There was one other deity that he always mentioned, which I couldn't find in any like mythology. Origin story for it? Yeah, huh. I think it's pronounced Fragon. 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 Couldn't find in any mythology or lore, uh, but he often told his clients that this was a deity 
it was a Siamese sex god. And mm. I couldn't understand if Fragon was the Siamese sex god or if together Fragon and Kali were the Siamese sex gods. So huh. something. So th as far as you could find, there was no record of it stemming from any Not major one. religion, spiritual yeah. practice. I even tried to find like similar spellings or just a god that is along the same lines but there's kind of sounds like an idol they just created themselves yeah i think you learned it from uncle willie and mm. it was just a made-up thing of course uncle willie yeah this year i've been trying to take care of myself more and more trying to make sure i'm on the right vitamins supplements that my body needs and if you've ever been to a vitamin store out there you know how overwhelming it can be and it's very hard to know what vitamins and supplements you should actually be taking well Look no more because Care Of has got you covered. If you're not familiar with what Care Of is, it's a subscription service that ships high quality personalized vitamin supplements and powders conveniently to your door every month. Care Of also helps track your wellness progress through their thoughtfully designed companion app. Supplements can be a huge support for how you feel and Care Of recognizes they're only a piece of the puzzle. Care Of just updated their app with new features that help you build a holistic daily wellness routine and help you track how your routine is working over time. As your needs and goals change, Care of can help you adjust your routine to match. Their quiz can be retaken at any time to give you updated recommendations, and you can adjust your habits and routine tracking in the app. And what's great is after you do the quiz and they give you all these different vitamins and supplements they recommend, you can pick and choose what you want. You don't have to go with everything that they give you. Maybe you already have a lot of something. You can remove that from your packet, which helps lower the cost down, which is really helpful to know. So if you wanna take charge of your health and wellness today, take advantage of this offer that we have gotten from care of for you for 50% off your first care of order go to takecareof.com and enter code lights out 50 for 50% off your first care of order go to takecareof.com and enter code lights out 50 so adrian promised he could make his clients more beautiful through a ritual massage not a suspect at the very least Adrian would take a small idol that we were just talking about for gone. And this idol was given to him by Uncle Willie. And he gave Adrian a list of things to do with it. During his medium sessions, he would knead the women's body with the idol all the way down to their genitals. He would later take the idol and wrap it in the used sanitary pads of an unmarried virgin woman. And then he would wrap it in a red cloth. After 30 days, he would unwrap the idol and place it on his altar. He would then splash the statue with blood preferably menstrual blood. During other rituals, he would convince desperate women that the only way that they could turn their life around was to have sex with him. According to his doctor, he had visited the medical clinic nearly 40 times for hormone injections to increase his sexual potency. During his training, Uncle Willie also taught him how to make a potion that made him more desirable. It was made from the bodily fluids of an unmarried virgin woman and clippings of her pubic hair. And Adrian believed that the more sex he had, the longer he would live. One of his clients was a 24-year-old girl named Tan Mui Chu Catherine, and she worked at a local bar. She had heard through a coworker that Adrian could cure ailments and depression, and she had just recently lost her grandmother, whom she was close with. The grieving process was long, and she sank into a deep depression. She wasn't close with her parents because they had sent her to a vocational center when she was only 13 years old. At the time, parents sometimes sent their kids to vocational schools if they saw them as problematic or if they had a run-in with the law. So Tan, and we'll be referring to her as Catherine, which you want to kind of explain that a little bit so it's not too confusing for people. Yeah, so as far as I could research in Singapore, there's obviously there's been a clash of cultures and that runs pretty deep from the when it was colonized by Britain and there were a lot of migrants from China and obviously it there was an interim where it was also part of Malaysia. So there's a lot of cultures there. So basically how you say their names is it's their surname first, then it's their usually typically their Chinese given name or Malaysian given name, and then it's their English first name. So they, they have essentially like it's different from you and I because it's first name, last name, or first name, surname, right? Our family name is last where it's family name first, Chinese or Malaysian given name, and then their European name. So we'll just be referring to most of these characters if they have one as their European or English 
name. Yeah, just for the sake of me not butchering their name over and over again. <laughs> it really helps. So Catherine felt unwanted and abandoned by her parents, as anyone would. And she spent most of her life longing for attention. By the time she left the school, she was 16 and worked as a barmaid. Out of desperation and loneliness, she reached out to Adrian for help when she was 24. She claimed that she had been cursed by one of the other barmaids at work because she had made more tips than her. And over a series of visits, she grew intimate with Adrian. By 1975, Adrian insisted that she move into his flat with him and his family so she could undergo serious treatment. His wife had already had suspicions that they were having an affair together, but he told her that they just needed to rent a room to Catherine to make more money. His wife made Adrian swear an oath while placing his hand on a picture of Jesus, promising that he wasn't having an affair. But as he went to place his hand on the picture, she was so furious that she grabbed a kitchen knife and stabbed him in the side. Swearing an oath wasn't enough, as she already knew he had been lying for weeks. She then tried to commit suicide by overdosing on sedatives, but failed. A few days later, she took the children and left the flat. She soon filed for divorce, which was granted the following year. Meanwhile, Adrian quit his job as a bill collector for Rita Fusion and began working as a medium full time. His business was growing and his techniques were getting better. He would go into trances, adopt different voices, and speak in different languages to put on a show for his clients. Neighbors would complain about the noise during his rituals. Late at night, they would hear bells ringing, people shouting, and the sounds of people jumping up and down. Some complained to the local housing board, but nothing was ever done about it. Adrian was so good at finding gullible clients, he even made about $3,000 every month from a single client. After his career took off, he then married Catherine in 1977. During their private ceremony, he fell into a trance and began speaking in a strange voice, and he claimed the voice was the deity for gone. He ordered Catherine to ring the ritual bell nine times and swear an oath to him. After she agreed, Adrian said that if she ever betrayed him, she would die a horrible death. When the ritual was over, Adrian's normal voice returned, and Catherine was now his holy wife. Even though it seemed like he was making good money and happily married, things were much darker beneath the surface. Adrian often physically abused Catherine behind closed doors. He constantly threatened her and even manipulated her into prostitution to supplement their income. When he went to work, he told her he needed to sleep with his clients to keep himself healthy as he claimed he had a heart condition and the only way to heal it was to have sex with other women. And he even got her to help convince some of his clients to have sex with him. In return, he encouraged Catherine to have sex with younger men and swallow their sperm to keep her young, beautiful, and healthy. Supposedly, she took him up on the offer and had sex with a teenage boy. Adrian made sure to be present so he could watch. At one point, she even had sex with her own 16-year-old brother. He then convinced Catherine's younger sister to prostitute herself so they could make even more money. Despite the incest and the abuse, Catherine enjoyed the luxury items they could now afford with the money. Adrian often bought her fancy dresses, beauty products, and personal trainers, but Catherine wouldn't be the only young woman persuaded by Adrian's money and power. Ho Ka Hong was born September 10, 1955, and her father died when she was only eight years old. She was then sent to live with her grandmother for the next seven years. But when she was 15, she returned to live with her mother and older sister. But she'd been gone for so long, she sensed that her sister had become her mother's favorite child. And the special treatment her sister got made her feel insecure and angry. She began having outbursts and lost her temper easily. And much like Catherine, she wanted more attention since her parents didn't give her any. Her mother wrote off the outbursts as teenage angst, but they continued into her 20s. At some point, her mother took Ka Hong's older sister to see Adrian. And after he showed them the needle and egg trick, they were both convinced his supernatural work was the real deal. During their sessions, Adrian would dunk Ka Hong's sister in tubs of water, electrocute her, drug her with tranquilizers, and rape her. Eventually, Adrian claimed that she was cured. Her mother was so impressed that they mentioned that her other daughter, Ka Hong, had severe anger issues. Adrian promised he could help her as well. By the time Ka Hung was 22 years old, she still had severe anger issues and they believed she was possessed by an evil spirit and her husband had cursed her. So in desperation, Ka Hung's mother dragged her to Adrian's office and he used the same egg trick on her and she was easily convinced he held some mystical powers that could heal her. And as they continued the healing ritual, she soon became his loyal follower. It became Adrian's goal to make Ka Hong one of his holy wives 
The only problem was that she was already married to a 25-year-old man named Lo Nguakwa Benson. But this wouldn't stop Adrian. Like a true manipulator, he isolated Ka Hong from her husband and the rest of her family. He convinced her that her family was immoral and that her husband was cheating on her and was going to force her into prostitution. She believed every word he said. Then together, she and Adrian performed a wedding ritual at the altar in his apartment, and she was officially declared his holy wife, just like Catherine. From then on, she began cutting her family out of her life. She also became physically violent toward her mother and even convinced Adrian to beat her mother with a broomstick if she came by the apartment. After only knowing Adrian for three months, she moved in with him and Catherine. It wasn't long before her husband, Benson, went looking for her. But they convinced him that Ka Hung desperately needed intense treatment, so she needed to stay with Adrian. Benson was stubborn and suspected that something was wrong, so he stayed in the house and observed what was really going on. Adrian encouraged him to join them in the rituals and treatments, especially in the shock treatments. So on the morning of January 7th, 1980, Benson and Ka Hung sat across from each other. Their arms were interlocked as they looked into each other's eyes. Their feet were tied together and submerged in a tub of water. To start the ceremony, Adrian took a syringe filled with his own urine and pumped it into their nostrils. Both of them violently vomited, but Adrian said that they had to continue if they were going to banish all of the evil spirits. He then placed Ka Hong's underwear and a used sanitary pad on Benson's head, and he placed a brass idol in his mouth. He claimed this was supposed to mock the demon, and then he placed the electrodes in the tub of water. And like always, he flipped the switches on their ECT machines. He turned the treatment dial until Ka Hong began to convulse. Benson immediately fell unconscious and dropped to the floor. When Adrian turned off the ECT machine, Ka Hong saw her husband motionless on the floor across from her. When Adrian checked his vitals, he realized Benson was dead. Adrian sold her a story about how it was all an accident, and he claimed that it must have been the demons that killed him, not the electricity. And he begged her to lie to police about Benson's death. When police arrived, she told them the made-up story. Benson had died after being shocked by a faulty electrical fan inside the bedroom. The coroner later claimed his death was, quote, an open verdict, which is essentially just an official statement affirming that a suspicious death had occurred, but they don't or they can't specify the cause. So Weird. it's basically just the police going and saying, well, they take the body, they check it out, and they're like, this is weird. He was electrocuted, but we can't dispute what they're saying about being shocked by an electrical fan. So we have nothing they else leave to it go at that. on. They can't like and since pinpoint like they did this to him. Exactly. In a way. And especially since his wife was like, yeah, it was just a complete accident and they couldn't find any motive outside of that. And there so was like, no right, evidence to go. Yeah, Story was, checks out. That was basically it. And the case was dropped. Wow. So we all know the truth of what really happened, but they were able to fool the police. And yeah, case closed. And over time, Benson's death began to weigh on Ka Hong. Even though she really never liked her husband, his death still affected her, and her mental health began to break. She fell into a deep depression, and she also began hearing strange voices in her head. She even began seeing the ghost of her dead husband. By the end of May that year, she was admitted to Woodridge Hospital and the doctors diagnosed her with schizophrenia, and they began treating her. Ka Hong made a quick recovery with treatment, and in two months she was discharged, which we all know, I don't think you can just like treat schizophrenia and be like, you're good to go. And I wonder exactly what they did. I mean, your I, guess is as good as mine probably. I'm assuming that. like medication. And then, yeah. And they're like, oh, she seems fine, so on your way. Yep, which the, we'll dive into that a little bit later too. So, after being discharged from the hospital, she returned to live with Adrian and Catherine. Luckily, she continued treatment and regular checkups at the hospital, and her relationship with her sister and mother also recovered, but she refused to leave Adrian. He continued giving her shock therapy and said it helped with driving the devil out of her body. According to Ka Hong, Adrian and Catherine also made her drink their urine. They had convinced her it would help ward off evil spirits. Adrian saw how strong his grasp on Ka Hong. Catherine was. They were his ceremonial holy wives, and now he could get away with murder without them betraying him. Whenever he wanted Ka Hung or Catherine to do something for him, he would say that the old master had possessed him, and he was instructed to pass on the master's orders. 
He'd even change his voice like a spirit had possessed him, and he would give them commands. He then decided to push the limits of their relationship in his work as a spiritual medium. For the next several years, Adrian wanted to get as many holy wives as he could, so he'd continue to con women into sex and take their money. Eventually, though, he had up to 40 holy wives. But in October of 1980, he ran into legal trouble when one of his clients accused him of rape. Lucy Lau was a cosmetic saleswoman that sold door to door, and one day she came across Adrian's apartment. And when he invited her inside, he tried to convince her that she was possessed by an evil spirit. He offered to cure her with a sex-based ritual like he did to most of his clients, but she didn't believe him and declined the offer. So he offered her a glass of milk with the holy properties in it, and she accepted. He then proceeded to go into his kitchen and pour a glass of milk, but then he snuck to his medicine cabinet where he grabbed two capsules of Dalmadorm, a sedative. He then broke the capsules into the milk and stirred the concoction. When he returned to Lucy, he handed her the glass. She slowly sipped on it while they continued their conversation, and when the sedatives kicked in, they made her groggy. But she didn't fall unconscious. She had lost enough control of her body that Adrian could take advantage of her. After it was over, Adrian threatened her, and she even scheduled more sessions with him out of fear. At some point, Lucy might have threatened to go to the police, and supposedly she might have blackmailed Adrian into giving Lucy's family a small loan. But since it wasn't the amount they wanted, Lucy followed through with her threat. She contacted the police in November 1980 and reported the sexual assault, and Adrian was arrested for rape. Catherine was arrested for abetting him. While Adrian was out on bail, he ordered Kahong to claim that she was with them when the alleged rape occurred, and he told her to tell the police that nothing happened. And she did as she was told, but the police kept the case open. Adrian and Catherine had to keep extending their bail at the police station every two weeks while the investigation continued. To try and distract the police's investigation, Adrian thought that they wouldn't have the resources to pursue a sexual assault case and a murder case at the same time. He also figured that the Hindu goddess, Kali, would be pleased with a human sacrifice, and her supernatural energy would lure the police away from him. It didn't take long to convince Catherine and Ka Hung of his plan. He acted like he was possessed by Kali, and she was speaking through him. He then told Catherine and Ka Hung that the goddess needed a human sacrifice, but not just any human. They needed to kill a child. It was the only way to get police off of their tail and get revenge on Lucy. He also mentioned that Forgone demanded they have sex with their female victims. So Adrian ordered Ka Hong to find him some fish, which was his codename for children. Ka Hong soon found a potential victim, an unnamed 10-year-old, and she led her back to the apartment. But Adrian complained that the girl was Indian, and he didn't want to offend the Hindu goddess, so they let the girl go. Ka Hong then got another girl named Clementi, Adrian complained to Ka Hung that if he was going to have sex with the girl, he was worried about injuring his penis because she was so skinny, so she was let go. Adrian then told Ka Hung to find him a girl with some flesh on her. A third girl was then brought to the apartment, but while they weren't looking, she called her friend on the landline, and she told Adrian that her friend had seen her being led away by Ka Hung. So in a panic, Adrian quickly set the girl free. After this, one more potential victim was set free because Adrian found out she had been recently blessed by a pastor so he believed the gods did not want her as a sacrifice. After searching for weeks, Ka Hong finally found their first victim on January 24, 1981. She spotted a nine-year-old girl named Agnes Hong outside of the Church of the Risen Christ in Toa Payo. Agnes went to the Holy Innocence Chinese Girl School and she was the youngest of nine children. A friend was last to see Agnes at church around 4 p.m., she had been waiting there for her sister to finish classes at 5 p.m. before walking home together. Ka Hong then lured Agnes to the apartment, promising her free food as much as she could eat, and Agnes couldn't resist. Once inside the apartment, Ka Hong laced her drink with Dalmadorm, and Agnes soon fell unconscious. Allegedly, Adrian then took her to the bedroom and sexually assaulted her. Around midnight, Adrian, Ka Hong, and Catherine smothered Agnes with a pillow until she was unconscious again. Adrian then pricked her finger and they each took a lick of her blood. Then they took a portrait of the goddess Kali and smeared it with Agnes's blood. The blood they didn't use was stored in vials and kept in the fridge. Then they took Agnes to the bathroom and forced her head into the toilet. Adrian held her body down and Catherine held her legs 
and Ka Hong held her head beneath the water until she was dead. It took several minutes to die. Adrian told the others he wanted to make doubly sure she was dead. After pulling out the ECT machine, he attached electrodes to her body and cranked the dial all the way up. Then they stuffed her remains into a brown vinyl bag and dumped her at a lift in Block 11 about a half mile from the church where she was abducted. The next night around 2 a.m., a carpenter was heading home after a midnight movie screening. Officer S.K. Menon later said the carpenter found the bag, opened the zipper, and out popped her head. After police examined the body, there were signs of sexual assault. And at the time, the crime rate in Singapore was incredibly low, so the pressure on local police began to grow. Only a week after the murder, Catherine and Ka Hong anonymously called Agnes's mother Pauline and threatened to chop Agnes's sister up. Police struggled with the little evidence that they had, and two weeks after the murder, the pressure got even worse because another child's body was found. Their next victim was 10-year-old Ghazali Marzuki. He went to school at Henry Park Primary, and for the Chinese New Year holidays, he had been staying with his grandmother. On February 6th, he was out at the playground with two of his cousins when a woman approached. This woman was Ka Hong. Adrian had asked her to go find a boy so that Agnes could have a partner. Ka Hong later said she picked him up because he looked like her dead husband. She asked him if he could help her collect some things from a friend's house nearby, and like the good kid he was, he agreed. His cousins watched as he got into a taxi with her, and this was the last time that he was seen alive. Once she got him back to the apartment, she forced him to swallow the sedatives, but it took him a long time to fall asleep. Seeing that he was a bit resistant to the sedatives, Adrian tied him to the bedpost as an extra precaution. He also gagged him and taped his eyes shut. Sure enough, he woke up soon after and thrashed around on the bed. Adrian hit him in the throat until he was stunned. He then drew blood from the boy's arm and they all drank it. Then they slathered the blood on other religious relics before drowning the boy in a bucket of water. He put up a fight, but they struggled to kill him. Adrian also used the ETC machine on him to make sure he was dead. But as he passed, he lost control of his bowels and also vomited. Plus, blood began pouring out of his nose and dripping all over the floor. After this, they all went out to dinner to celebrate leaving his body in the apartment. Adrian and Ka Hong later disposed of the body in the middle of the night, but they panicked thinking someone had seen them, so they quickly dumped the body under a small tree. His body was bruised and bloodied. Meanwhile, Catherine tried to clean every last trace of blood in their apartment. As brutal as Ghazali's death was, his trail of DNA would become crucial to the investigation. He had left a trail of blood that led straight back to Adrian's apartment. Adrian and the rest tried to clean every spot before sunrise, but it wouldn't be enough. When the body was discovered between the blocks 10 and 11, police arrived at the scene 25 minutes later and quickly spotted a trail of blood. It led them all the way back to a staircase at block 12, Toapayo. The wrong seven. The bloodstains led Officer Menon straight to Adrian's apartment. The front door had a small oval mirror and a knife blade hanging from the door. At the time, Adrian was dressed in a business shirt and pants carrying a bag. It looked like he was just about to make a run for it, but police kept him in sight while they searched the apartment. Inside his flat, they found an altar holding pictures of Jesus Christ, crucifixes, and Hindu and Chinese idols. There was also a small puppet holding a miniature knife bowls filled with eggs and strange liquids. Many of the objects were splashed with blood. In the bedroom, the headboard was also smeared with blood, and they also found a stain of fresh blood in the kitchen. When Officer Menon asked what the fresh blood was from, Adrian said that they had been slaughtering chickens for the Chinese New Year. Tess would later reveal, though, it was in fact human blood. We actually have a short clip we'll play of an interview they did with Officer Menon, talking about what it was like to be the first on scene. I found that he was evil. No, I found that he was evil. He was evil. And he was practicing black magic. I thought so. And that's the impression that I knew. I knew by his, after speaking to him that he was, he had the gift of the gap. He could speak very well. So, the conclusion was he was a gone man. The house was very easy. Amber lights, which like amber lights, no, not the, not the, not this type, this type of light, me, but amber in color. That's very easy, dark. Right in front, you enter, there's an altar. There are Chinese deities, photos, photographs of Chinese deities, Indian deities, especially the deity called Kali. 
teacher's guys photograph they were not mistaken and this Indian thing and there was the photographs was glasses were smeared with something red which later turned out to be Kimmel I kept an eye on them and then meanwhile our officers our search of this and they found some more red patches very tiny red patches on the crevices of a mosaic in the kitchen he asked him he said Chinese you just ended I cut, I cut chicken man he says chicken but never mind he said, call the chemist so we called for the chemist he came running he took some time huh? come from SDA to come here I told him my facts just test and see he tested and confirmed it was human blood that's the time we made the arrest that is how we solved the case I felt really proud to have handled this, this investigation. It was a challenge. It was a challenge. Although things were there, we still had to link every piece of evidence to that was there. I cannot imagine another such case happening. I feel this way. I can't imagine that there will be another case of this nature. So obviously, his involvement in this case impacted him greatly. I mean, I couldn't imagine walking into this apartment after all this just happened and observing what he saw like especially because murder things like this were so rare at the time right in the city it would be like it seems like you just got really unlucky if you were the the police officer to roll up to this scene yeah it's interesting that like one of his first thoughts was that this guy's practicing black magic here yeah and I mean, obviously he's you know he lives there so he's aware of you know all the cultural and religious practices there but his first immediate thought is black magic's being done here there's yeah. something evil happening in this apartment and for those that are listening it might be a good idea to go you know take a moment and go watch that clip back again because we do have captions on it and again it's they're not perfect because his english is very broken but uh, we did our best to try to you know caption what he was actually saying so it's helpful because i know just listening to it, it's very hard to follow along with what he's saying but um it's definitely worth watching through with the captions because you kind of understand a little bit better so adrian catherine and kahong were then arrested and brought in for questioning meanwhile investigators searched the flat several vials of blood were found in the fridge they also found a pair of slippers shorts and a handkerchief soaked in blood they all belonged to adrian they also found a bloodstained blouse belonging to Ka Hong shoved in a bucket. But the most damning piece of evidence was a single piece of paper inside a telephone book. And in that paper had both the victims' names on it. At the time, Agnes's name was in earlier news reports, so that could have been a coincidence. But Ghazali's body had just been found that morning and the police wouldn't find out the victim's name until later that day. Back at the station, Adrian denied any involvement. He said he had Ghazali's name on a piece of paper because he was one of his clients. He claimed the boy had had a nosebleed, so Adrian fixed him up and sent him on his way. Police had to wait for the forensics test to come back, which would take a while. Adrian eventually admitted to the police that he was a fraud. He explained his egg and needle trick, and he admitted to faking the deity voices when he was in trances. He also confessed that the murders were in response to the rape investigation against him. He claimed he wanted to confuse the police with a smokescreen of murders to draw them away from the sexual assault case because murder is a lesser crime is that his is that his uh assumption there uh, oh that logic is the flawed. idea the idea was yeah it's stupid he's like makes no sense oh why i'll oh, do murders after... to distract from my sexual assault case yeah that's that's either a bold-faced lie or he somehow rationalized that thinking because i don't think there's a more severe punishment for sexual assault as opposed to murder in singapore right so it's not like like what's the motive for doing that it just seems like i mean that lends to his mindset and where he's at mentally yeah or where, the other idea is that if he commits these murders and doesn't get caught then the human sacrifices would please the goddess mm, and that's then they right would help him right, right of course He's going to get that that help from Kali. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Every Plate. I'm a huge fan of meal kits, but especially Every Plate, which is owned by HelloFresh. I love both of them. I use them both almost on a weekly basis. 
What's great about every plate though, is that it's 25% cheaper than shopping. It's the most budget friendly meal kit on the planet without compromising the quality of the ingredients and the deliciousness of the recipes. Cook once, eat twice with every plate's new dinner to lunch dishes, tasty filling meals for both dinner and lunch the next day. Each recipe is carefully crafted to ensure the ingredients can be easily repurposed so you don't feel like you're just eating leftovers. Plus save time making lunch on busy weekdays with most of the work done at dinner. Try new favorites such as sweet soy chicken tacos and chicken stir fry, chicken sausage flatbreads and tomato pasta and more. All available for a slight upcharge for a limited time only. I've never had any issues with the produce being rotten or moldy. And if there ever is an issue, their customer service is top notch and they'll get you a new box straight away. Every plate saves me so much time and money. I don't have to go to the grocery store. I don't spend this huge exorbitant grocery bill, you know, with grocery prices on the rise. And I don't waste food anymore because I only make enough for the servings that I need. Get started with every plate for just $1.49 per meal by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering promo code 49 lights out. But of course, the religious symbols covered in blood suggested something else was going on. Behind closed doors, the two women also confessed everything to police. Two days after they were arrested, all three were charged with murder. When this murder case hit the news, it spread like wildfire, as you can probably imagine. The locals read about the gory and sexually explicit murders in detail, and they were so shocked they gathered in large crowds outside the courthouse, hoping to catch a glimpse of the sinister ritual killers of Singapore. The accused were allowed one month of psychiatric evaluation. They were all fit to stand trial and the court proceedings moved along quickly and the judge didn't allow any of them to plead guilty. So this is where it gets a little different from the US court system. So they basically tried to plead guilty. The judge said no. Singapore is really big on tough on crime, especially now. Like just a couple of weeks ago, they hanged a woman the first time in 19 years. She was charged for trafficking 31 grams of heroin, which is not that much when you really think about it. Yeah, they're super strict on drugs, like yeah, back weed in, and I mean anything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Back in May, they hanged a man for trafficking less than, I think it was somewhere around like 3.4 pounds of marijuana. And a month before that, they hanged a man for two pounds. Wow. Cannabis, yeah. That's wild. That? So they do not screw around. And I know we've mentioned Singapore sometime before. Um, They've even like criminalized chewing gum. Yeah. And like littering and stuff yeah. is super big deal there. Go to so, jail for that. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, it's like the streets are super clean, but they have a, a very, very strict stance on crime here. Wow. A 51 out of 54 inmates today that are on death row try and guess what their crimes are. Oh. So the vast majority. Probably not murder. Not murder. Because the murder rate's so low there. That it's probably drugs, right? Yeah, it's drug-related crimes. They're drug-related crimes on death row. 51 out of 54 wow. inmates on death row. Wow. Isn't that crazy? So for a crime like this, ritual killings, they're going obviously straight for yeah, the death gonna, penalty. They're not right. screwing around. So the weird caveat is that in Singapore, the court can reject a guilty plea if the crime is punishable by death because it's... The, the logistics are weird, but it's essentially that if it's a death penalty case, you plead guilty. The court can only accept the plea after the prosecution has proven guilt through trial. So as far as I understood it, it would essentially mean that you would still have to go through an entire trial, but the people who pleaded guilty wouldn't have a defense. So, I, so I think on paper, they're saying, no, you're going to have a defense because we don't want to look like we're just executing people out here. So we're going to go through a full-blown trial. You're going to have your defense. We're going to do it. And then we're going to kill you. Well, and there's no negotiation. It's not like they can plea deal or something, you know, yeah. where they get a lesser sentence or it's like life in prison. It's, they're going No matter it. what, it's death. Yeah. So it doesn't matter exactly. if you plead guilty before or after, it's, you're it's death. Exactly. Period. Like and, if and they can paper, prove it. They yeah. want it clean. So it's like you're getting a defense. We're doing the whole shebang. So... They don't screw around. So pleading is just not, 
not an option. Yeah, I think maybe for lesser crimes, but you know, in like the U.S. justice system, it's yeah, like you were saying, you plead, you plead, plead guilty, guilty, hoping to get a lesser sentence. sentence. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But no, here it's like you are pleading not guilty, and we're gonna try the shit out of you. That's as far as I understand it. But again, I'm not a lawyer. I know I've said that many times, but yeah, that you is didn't study uh, Singa- law in Singapore. <laughs> yeah, so. no, I apologize if I got any of that wrong. Adrian and Catherine were the only ones who tried to plead guilty, but were rejected. As far as Ka Hong, she she was just, just like, accepted I'll go through the, it. the fate. Yeah. yeah. The trial lasted 41 days, which is a fairly long time. Even though they all confessed their crimes to police, the prosecution needed to prove intent if they were going for the death sentence. They presented all the evidence that they had found in the apartment, including the victims' names written down, the sedatives used on the victims, a syringe human blood found across the apartment and strands of the victim's hair found in the carpet. It was too early for DNA evidence in the 1980s, but they were able to match the blood types of the victims. On the stand, Adrian eventually claimed he was the sole perpetrator of the crimes. He also admitted to killing Ka Hong's husband, Benson, but he claimed that he had never had sex with Ka Hong because he was haunted by her husband's spirit. He also denied raping Lucy Lau and Agnes. And then he testified that his main reason for killing the children was to offer them as a sacrifice to the deity Kali, who would help him escape the rape charge and solve other problems of his. He said, quote, I killed to get even with the world. The defense's goal is to convince the court that none of the killers were in control of themselves during the crimes. Adrian's defense claimed that he was mentally ill at the time of the murders. His belief in Kali was a delusion and that only an unsound mind would dump a body so close to their home. As for Catherine, they brought in another psychiatrist that believed she was mentally impaired by reactive psychotic depression. He claimed she was depressed before she met Adrian due to her family background and the feelings of abandonment, and the physical abuse and threats from Adrian deepened her depression. But Adrian always explained that the abuse only happened when the deities worked through him. He wasn't responsible and she would believe him. Then she would take certain drugs that made her hallucinate. The prosecution psychiatrist, Dr. Chi, disagreed. He said that Catherine had admitted to being happy with the material lifestyle Adrian gave her. She loved the fine clothes and beauty salon treatments. He argued that someone with reactive psychotic depression wouldn't have cared so much about her appearance. Also, she had confessed to police that she knew Adrian was a fraud long before the killings. She knew he was a con man, but continued to follow along. But right before trial, she changed her stance in court to claim she was acting completely under his influence because she believed he was connected to the divine. The prosecution psychiatrist's opinion was that Catherine was a liar and she was mentally sound during the crimes. As for Ka Hong, both doctors agreed that she had schizophrenia long before she met Adrian. Her stay in Woodbridge Hospital had helped her recovery. The defense psychiatrist argued that Ka Hong suffered a relapse during the child killings, but Dr. Chi pointed out that none of the Woodbridge doctors saw any signs of relapse during the six months of her follow-up checkups. Her last checkup was January 31st, 1981, a few days after the first murder. If Ka Hung was impaired by her condition, she would have been nearly incapacitated and the doctors would have been able to tell. And she had even confessed to police after her arrest that she was excited during the killings. Ending his testimony, Dr. Chi said it was nearly impossible that three people with different mental illnesses could have shared a common delusion of needing to kill children to please the gods. In the defense's closing statements, they tried to paint the picture that the killers were all mentally disturbed individuals. They also argued that the women truly believed Adrian had supernatural powers and they had no free will. Adrian's defense argued that he was once a regular man, but he completely changed once he began dabbling in the occult, which his defense called the unreasonable world of atrociousness, and he was soon disconnected from reality. Catherine's defense claimed she was just carrying out orders without thought, and Ka Hung's defense claimed that in her schizophrenic mind, She believed if the children were killed, they would go to heaven and not grow up evil like her mother. As for the prosecution, they pointed out how deliberate each abduction and murder occurred. Adrian was a mastermind, and he openly admitted to lying to police. He also constantly lied to his wife, his clients, and the psychiatrists. As for Catherine, she loved Adrian and wanted to do anything she could to help him, and Ka Hong was manipulated into joining. Plus, there were possibly two female voices on the threatening phone calls to the victim's mother, which must have been Catherine Kahong, or both. In the prosecutor's final statement, they said, 
My lords, to say that Lim was less than a coward who preyed on little children because they could not fight back, killed them in the hope that he would gain power or wealth, and therefore did not commit murder, is to make no sense of the law of murder. It would lend credence to the shroud of mystery and magic he has conjured up his practices and by which he managed to frighten, intimidate, and persuade the superstitious, the weak, and the gullible into participating in the most lewd and obscene acts. So basically what they're saying there, I know that's a lot of words and kind of word vomity, but basically they were arguing Adrian was a manipulator and he used these religious acts to persuade the vulnerable and the superstitious into helping him murder and that they were all complicit. Very similar to many cult leaders. Yeah. And the way they go true. about it. I mean, he had up to 40 holy wives and I guess not really technically a cult. It wasn't organized enough really to be a cult, but similar a lot of similar characteristics that you find among other cult leaders. Definitely. You know, they believe they have this gift and then they use that gift to manipulate others and then they prey on the weak to to do their bidding. And I mean, he was definitely on his way. Yep, exactly. I mean, all he was missing was like what a name for right. his cult right. and like possibly a compound that I guess he used his apartment in that way. But yeah, very much like a cult. Which, you know, thank God he was caught when he did, because it probably would have gone way, way worse. But on May 25th, 1983, crowds swarmed the courthouse waiting for the verdict. And that verdict only took 15 minutes. The two judges who oversaw the case weren't convinced that the killers were mentally unsound during the crimes. They called Adrian abominable and depraved. They called Catherine an artful and wicked person who was always a willing party to Lim's loathsome and nefarious acts and that she killed because she loved him. As for Ka Hong, she was a simple person and easily influenced. And again, they acknowledged that she had schizophrenia, but as far as her hospital checkups showed, she was in remission during the killings. The judge believed she was fully aware of what she was doing. So all three of them were found guilty of murder and sentenced to death by hanging. The two women didn't react to the sentencing, but Adrian screamed out, thank you, my lords. As they were led out to the police vans, the crowd swarmed around and booed them. After the sentencing, Adrian accepted his fate, but Catherine and Kahung would later file for appeal. Three years after the trial in August 1986, the Court of Criminal Appeal rejected their appeals, and they failed again when trying to appeal to Singapore's president and London's Privy Council. So in the end, all three of them had to accept their fate. Supposedly, Adrian was hated in prison, which doesn't surprise me at all. The other inmates abused him and treated him like an outcast. And over the next few years, local journalists reminded the public of his horrific crimes. On the day of Adrian's execution, he asked a priest to absolve him of his sins and Holy Communion. Catherine and Ka Hung had also converted to Catholicism and also requested absolution and the Holy Communion. Which they're like, well, if we're going to die, we better wipe our sins clean so we can make it to paradise, right? Yeah, specifically to the go. Catholic God yeah, too. Yeah, of course. I don't know if that was more of a move to be like, hey, we're back into like the mainstream religions where we don't believe in that crap anymore. So I don't know what that was all about, or maybe they truly did believe. I'm not sure. On November 25th, 1988, the three killers were fed their last meal and led to the hangman's noose. Spectators notice Adrian smiling the entire time. After the hangings, they were given a short Catholic funeral mass and their bodies were cremated soon after. To this very day, these murders are remembered as the worst in Singaporean history. A book titled Unholy Trinity by Alan John was written about this case in 1989. Two movies were made about the case in the 1990s titled God or Dog and Medium Rare. Both were box office bombs. But the ritual killings have carved out their infamous legacy in Singaporean history. Wow. Do you think, I think the biggest question, which you touched on earlier, do you think Adrian truly believed? I really don't. I really don't. I just, I think he saw it as a pathway for him to, uh, you know, obtain all of those selfish desires that he wanted and saw it as a way to manipulate people. And I question Willie too. Oh, for sure. I, I yeah. question that he was really in it for the right reasons. Seems like he was a seasoned con man who obviously they, you know, later admit that their tricks were fake and, you know, there's no there's no sorcery happening at all. They're just fooling people. There's bad magicians basically. Right. 
and fooling people into making them believe they have these powers and obviously when you start bringing in deities and things like that you're you know sometimes it you know put the razzle dazzle on people and like oh you know he's he must know something you know he's connected with this deity that deity he's doing these rituals he's you know he's got some some knowledge here it seems like so maybe he does actually know what he's talking about but i feel that may, maybe a part of him like especially as he went forward and you know when they got he got away with murdering benson maybe he like really started believing i don't know that it was initial that he believed but i think as it went on he definitely started believing like i am this you know powerful individual and you know i think he thought there was some legitimacy to what he was doing especially with kind of how cocky they were they were they mentioned how close the body was dumped i think to his third victim which is that just them being sloppy as hell or is that him being possibly overconfident because yeah, he truly does think kelly is helping him he know? seems just dumb too like That's he just seems like true a dumb dude like agreed and, and dumb evil dude who's willing to do anything for what he wanted and i think once he got it again it, it's what happens with so many cult leaders is they you know sometimes even cult leaders maybe start in a good place where they're like you know it's about spirituality it's about you know bringing people together but then once they get a taste of you know the other the side you know yeah. the power and manipulation control and having people subservient to you i think certain individuals just something just clicks in their brain and they're like oh i like this power i like this control and i and i think it's deeply rooted in in within them like i don't think this is something that just like happened overnight i think I mean, if you go back to his childhood, he seemed like he had anger problems and things like that. Like there's this deep rooted hate and anger within that manifests as time goes on. And then all it takes is sort of that perfect storm to happen and it just unlocks everything. And it's just like everything just clicks all at once. And he's like, oh, this is who I'm destined to be. And he's like, I'll, I'll get the power any way I have to. It doesn't matter if I it's at the expense of people's lives or killing children or drinking blood or putting on a show for people and making people believe i'm this you know because he's taking advantage of the culture there he's taking advantage of so many things yeah, I was to gonna bring that up i think he knew exactly what the market looked like for yeah, religion that's a great way to put it yeah. the market for sure of, and of he his, as a as a good con man does they just go straight in there and find everyone who's a, about that lifestyle and just they just abuse the shit out of it and manipulate people i feel like that that's what happens most times i think it's almost rare to find an individual who who does these types of evil acts who to the grave is the same person from the beginning to the end where they're like i believe i am this divine one you know who's worshiping this deity or demon or something like that where they're they don't stray away from that at all the fact that he was catholic at the beginning and he ends being a catholic and in the middle is just this yeah. mess of of whatever you want to call it says a lot to me it's like he was only in that because it was convenient to what he wanted and helped him achieve the goals that he was trying to to reach Definitely. but once that ended he was like oh abandon it like abandon I'm ship out. yeah i'm not that guy so when he was face to face with death yeah he's like right. oh i better see a priest really quick because who knows what the afterlife right looks rather like. than being confident in his beliefs and Kali has me Kali is gonna save me mm -hmm. you know and taking that to the grave and that perspective to the grave says a lot about him as an individual that yeah. he's just a weak-minded dude who saw an opportunity to take advantage of people in order to make money and feed his sick desires and that's exactly what he did at the and end of the day it's crazy because catherine admitted that she knew he was a fraud when she was talking to police but she benefited off of it she was getting the nice clothes the personal trainers stuff like that so i'm convinced that she was in on it but what about ka hong i think she's yeah, the strangest she, aspect of this case because of her she obviously has schizophrenia and possibly I don't, who knows what else but i i really hated how they tried to throw her schizophrenia around in the courtroom because it's like they kept calling it like she's in remission for whatever it's like you mean she's being treated for her schizophrenia because you can't be cured of that and i don't think it's called remission i could be totally wrong but let's say she wasn't taking medication and she was back to her old self or whatever that doesn't just make you 
start killing people it no. doesn't make you more prone to just start murdering people right i mean yeah you can be maybe a bit more unhinged but i didn't like how they used that aspect of her but did do you think she believed i think she did i think, I so think she out of all of them believed in what adrian was was saying and the things he believed in i think she really did yeah, i think i mean the fact that she is. went as far as she did to abduct the children you know she really was like a dedicated supporter of his and i think he saw that and knew that and took full advantage of that yeah and and you know you can debate whether or not she was in the right mind and understood what she was doing or you know the schizophrenia came into play there i think is a is a fair argument but at the end of the day she did she aided in the murders of of these kids so it's like should there be punishment there sure but unfortunately in singapore it's like there's not a lot of options there it's, it's like you're either part of it or not yeah. so unfortunately she because she was a part of it whether she was you know mentally ill during it didn't really matter it was you know ultimately she she played a big enough role that you know they charged her with the same crime so yeah. i think i think that's the, the definitely the controversial part of this is if she deserve the punishment that she received based on everything that we know about her and her mental illness but i would argue that all of them are mentally ill adrian's probably mentally ill in some way shape or form yeah. whether diagnosed or not but or he's not and he's just a psychopath you yeah know, that's, and that i don't think just being mentally ill should protect you from no absolutely from being, not yeah absolutely not there's plenty of people that function completely normally and don't kill people exactly that deal with mental illness so it doesn't excuse you from from committing crimes or anything like that but you know schizophrenia is a little bit of a different story i think there's a some more factors you have to consider with that but definitely so 15 years after the trial a publication called the new paper in singapore held a poll they requested the readers to vote on the worst crime committed in 1998 but the 1981 ritual murder still took 30 percent of the vote which says a lot of how that impacted singaporean society as for adrian's flat in Toa Payo. It was taken by the state after the murders and it went back on the market in 1987. So somebody lives there. It's out there. Out there. Supposedly, or, I tried to look to see if it was haunted or whatnot, but as far as I could find, it wasn't. But um, the real estate agent that I remember, she talked, she was like, it's Singapore. Someone's going to live there. Yeah. We're too crammed that. in here. It's good real estate. Like, it doesn't matter. They don't there just, was blood splattered all over the place. And it's not the like they just tear it down either. It's right. part of a huge, huge flat. So. Yep. so yeah, so that is the very disturbing story of Adrian Lim and the Toa Pio murders. We're going to go on and wrap up today's episode there. Let us know your thoughts uh, in the comments if you're watching on YouTube. What do, you, what do you think? Do you think the punishment fit the crime? Do you think there is other factors in play? Do you think that Adrian actually believed what he was he was preaching and and in the rituals that he was doing you know do you do you agree with my perspective on it or you know that this was just, he's just a really good con man that learned from an even better con man and he used that to manipulate his victims let us know but that is going to be it for us today we'll see you guys next week with another dark one and until then lights out everybody <laughs>